Thank you for joining us. For those of you who don't know, I'm Anthony Penn. I'm the Agnes Culinary Professor of Humanities, and I'm also the founding director of the... His mic's on. I'm also the founding director of the Houston and Riches Rice Education Project. The project's effort is to create greater synergy between Rice and the larger Houston community. To do that in a way that transforms how we think, how we think, how we research, and how we learn on campus. But to also highlight the talent, the capacities, the structures, and the potential that is Houston. One of the efforts we're very proud of that's part of this here project is the religion and hip hop culture course. For us, this is a way to appreciate two of the dominant forces in human history, religion and hip hop. We wanted to take an opportunity before the class comes to an end to thank Rice and Houston for the support and encouragement we've received. Not everybody could be in the classroom for this course, but we wanted you to have a small taste of what folks who are taking the course have experienced. It's been a delight and a privilege to share this classroom space with Professor Bernard Freeman. That has been a delight. And what we wanted to do again is give you a taste, just a small taste, of some of the wonders that have been religion and hip hop culture. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out today. How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Our guest today, I'm sure, needs no introduction. He is a music mogul, he's a fashion mogul, he's a media mogul, he's a philanthropist, humanitarian, cultural icon, one of the most important people that we have today representing the hip-hop culture. Please give a warm welcome to our guest today, Russell Sinner. Practice 
uh, is in some ways, I would say, all religion stands on uh, the same principles. And then uh, we said it all the prophets spoke about the same principles, uh, slightly in different languages, in different colors, but the same, uh, same uh, modes to the same place. There are many Christian yogis. Buddhism is a religion, as is Christianity, as is, as is uh, Muslim faith, or as uh, Islam is or uh, Judaism is the faith, religion. Uh, yogi philosophy is not a uh, religion. The Bhagavad Gita or the Krishna teaches Arjuna yoga on the battlefield or the Yoga Sutras. There's no contradiction with any religion. You can be a Muslim yogi, you can be a Christian yogi, you can be a Buddhist yogi. Um, but it just has to do with the problems, but the, the, the yoga practice is the science for, for um, there are eight steps in yoga. I'm going to tell you what, because this is a religion class, right? Absolutely. Eight steps in yoga. The first step is the yama, say like the Ten Commandments, ahimsa, non-mama, satya, non-lying, estate, non-stealing, brahmacharya. It's in every religion. Control of sexual power, so no use. So they can, you know, they can get away with it. Afari gaha, non-greed. They're like Ten Commandments. And the second set of the observances. And it's, you know, uh, cleanliness, contentment, hard work, dedication, and faith. Uh, study of the self, and it could be any scripture will do, or study of self, and it's one of the primary jobs, giving all your actions to God. And then the physical practice, asana. So the eight steps, the seventh one is, I don't want to be all eight, but the seventh one is meditation, and union, and samadhi is likened to Christ consciousness, or the state of yoga, and there are different stages of it. So samadhi is what we refer to uh, as enlightenment, as what the Christ, or heaven on earth, where and it's described as having a total still mind. And Jesus would say, be still and know. And in all the scriptures, there's this there's a passage about stillness. Uh, recently, there was a book which I gave to Oprah, and she made it very popular. It was called The Power of Now. So if you know that book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That God told it. And that described a state of yoga, because yoga, the state of yoga is a, a state of pure stillness. So we, uh, the second sutra, yoga shitta, preti niroda. Yoga, or union with God, happens with the cessation or the fluctuation of the mind. So the mind is still, it's only God and consciousness. Sounds like a lot of rap, but you've been in a car accident, right? You've read when, where you even stop breathing. This kind of single point of focus is it promotes a kind of bliss. This is what they mean by enlightenment. You can live like that. If everything moved that slow all the time, you were driving a car, you wouldn't miss a flower. You would see everything, you know. And that, that is a state of consciousness where there's no noise. When the noise settles, there's no way to it. And as a search for these, I guess, these different methods of finding peace for yourself, is this intrinsic to you being the son of a pastor? Have you always had an outlook for different religions or whatever? No. No, I went to yoga. There's so many fun. There's so many cute girls. There's nobody. There's nothing in yoga but cute girls. And me and my friend Bobby Travel went, and there's like 50 girls and two gay guys and me and Bob. <laughs> and that, that was that was a long time, almost 20 years ago. So it's it's evolved since, and more people are, are, are practicing. But then one day, you know, after a few days, my first day out, like I felt completely relieved. And I thought that relief was taking away my drive. But nothing happens except for true stillness. No creativity. The second that you laugh is because the mind is open. Or the second that you're focused, the mind is still. So the execution that you need, the, the happiness that you look for, the, the, um, all of those things happen in stillness. In the second of stillness, the idea is to extend this. So I went because there were two girls. They gave me a, eventually he passed me the yoga scriptures as a teacher. And I started to read you know, all the scriptures. And, and I, and, you know, five years ago I wrote a book trying to simplify the teachings. And, and Oprah liked the book, and that was it. When she liked it, 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 it people said it changed their life. And it inspired me to write this new book, which is out now, uh, Super Rich. And you say you, you use it initially to find the true sentence of peace, but you're a man that has a very busy schedule. Is, is the yoga something that's penciled in on the schedule book, or do you I don't care. I don't care. I go over, yeah, take it as needed? I don't know. I go over every morning, and I meditate without fail. And every day, at some point, I do a physical practice. Um, it's just, you know, I think that I'm more productive if I do. So 
So I'm pretty, uh, I practice it very religiously. I, I don't miss days. And so with your new book, Super Rich, you're showing that these new practices have helped you become an even more successful businessman. Yeah, because yeah, um, I wrote this book, and, and my brother, you know, Rev is a prosperity preacher, and along the line from Rev Knight to Bishop Joy and all that, and, it, they, you know, they, and some of these teachings are coincide, but the, the book, maybe some of you have been here a month, and he says, give it all away, and you see people sneaking out the back door. You see, it's like, give it all away, let it go. Let me let it go. Like, you can't carry it to heaven. You don't carry it. Don't be attached to it. You could, you could read a translation of any of those scriptures, of any of those religions, about attachment as opposed to about having anything. But the idea, in the first chapter, I wrote the book in two months. And it took 12 months to finish it. Because 10 months I went into the first chapter. And, um, and, and to try to explain this philosophy, because the fringe benefit of this, this lifestyle is, is resources. I mean, things come. So Jesus taught two sermons. One to the masses, where he said, if you do these things, if you're this kind of servant, if you live this life, you, you, know, you don't have to be anxiety prone. You can pay the Romans in taxes. It'll work out if you live this life. But he told his, his disciples, if you live this life, you'll be close to God. The yeah, idea that good givers and great getters, we all know that. Um, but this good giver who is trading is not quite as exciting to any employer, any business, anything. This person really has an honest, um, unconditional uh, service. You like him when he comes down the street, you see him coming. It's like, hey, I want to do anything you want to do. I want to do a good job of it. I want to study it. I want to be your best. You know, you love that dude. As opposed to the dude who comes the other way, right? I will do this if you give me that, and I will, you know, so the giver, as opposed to the, the, the trader, you know, and, and that's it. So the books that we have, these prosperity books, operating from this super rich or this still mind, this place, operating from this book, the, the, these ideas, is an operation from prosperity, a prosperity, or I'm sorry, abundance, right? That, that's operating from needing nothing in a state of abundance. Um, they skip the part about God sometimes, in a way. They skip the part about just giving unconditionally. And they skip the part about needing nothing. Because the, 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 the goal, Christ consciousness, the person lives in the state of needing nothing. I mean, you can have all the toys you want. No matter how rich you are, you can sit your ass in only one seat at a time. <laughs> right? And, and to be comfortable in that seat is life's goal. Now, who the intended audience for this question? It was written the way, even though it talks about the Bhagavad Gita and it takes all the scriptures, it's written so the people in the hood and, and in prisons and in places where it's needed. But I found, you know, I know that it's, it, it's a bestseller for, you know, it's been for six weeks and off and on and back on the road. So, you know, it's doing very, very well. And, and people from Bobby Walter to Ellen DeGeneres and people like that have praised the book and held it up and talked about how much it affected them. Um, but it's written. I find it that, that the people need the most of the business. I got one bad review, I got five star reviews in a lot of places. The one bad review was Business Week. And Business Week gave me, and I was inspired because Deepak Chopra and I were boxed into one bad review, one star for two of us. We shared a star. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, there's no practical advice. And the creative people who build businesses build businesses because they have this still mind, they find this white space. The people who follow up, you know, and they keep the quarterly thing going after the guy dies, they leave it in the hands of people who are not creative. So the oil man doesn't, you know, become a business yogi and find new sustainable, creative ways to, to service the, the energy problem. Or the food people, even if they know that all the oil that you can use besides what the army is using is all the grain and all the water and, and the worst comic disaster in human history, the 15 billion farm animals, and the greatest cause of global warming times, two times all the trains, planes, and automobiles put together are the animals you eat. But they're not thinking, let's figure out something else. They're, they're thinking quarterly profits. So the creative people, those people who are open-minded, who are finding new, sustainable, good ideas, uh, need this kind of this kind of still mind, this kind of creativity. And so the book is a business book. I built my, my biggest company, my universe company. It was built nine years ago and I started it because people didn't have 
they get their check, they have check cash in place, they get robbed, they get online, they, they uh, pay sometimes 8 to 12 hours a week just to pay their bill, they couldn't rent shit, they couldn't do nothing on the internet, they couldn't get a hotel room. And now, you know, we, we had so much innovation, but we did it because people needed it. And, it was a, and here's a guy who can't count, built the financial service industry. There are many competitors now, we're still the best, like I say, so we're still the best. We got the revelation, now we're cheaper in the bank. We're 50% the cost of a bank. It was done because it was an innovative process. It was something that people needed. And it was even almost done as a philanthropic or social idea in the beginning. So I think that kind of mindset creates new entrepreneurs, opportunities, as opposed to the guy who's you know, looking for the other business book. The business book is also, you know, the heart has ideas. So if you freeze it, which is what you know, society does, generally does, then you'll have ideas, innovation. People glow from the practice. People posture get bigger, they get you know, they get taller, they get brighter. So the, the practice, the practices of living just, you know, a non-harm. The, the first one I said non-harm, just you know, to cause less harm. It just, it just makes you brighter. You know, not to lie, not to steal. I mean the basic idea, right? Maybe a better person. Right? These things, if you start to live and try to embrace these ideas, which are already etching your heart, and if you read them again, if they ring a bell, they make you a better person. So you, all of you, if you take a step, any step toward you, you've heard Christians say, you take a step towards God and take two steps toward you, and feel it, and people can see it on you, smell it on you. So, by people applying this to, them, to, the, to their everyday life, um, how can they better themselves outside of business? I mean, you're saying the book is super rich, but to me, it seems that being super rich is not just being rich financially, but living a richer and more fulfilling life. Is that somewhat the, the double meaning? Well, the meaning of the book is totally about the, conscious, the state of consciousness, the state of needing nothing. Um, you know, there's the rich guy who wakes up, uh, money-wise, who wakes up, and the stock market jumps, he jumps. Stock market go down, he go down. He dies with a heart attack, you know, or whatever, or just, you know, the catch of cancer. And your nervous system gives you your sickness, right? You know, you know, if you adopt a proper diet, if you take care of your temple, if you do the things in the scripture, you're probably going to live longer and be happier. Um, it's important, you're all going to live longer and be happier. Um, so, if, if you take it, you know, you, at every step that you feel better, on my first class, I came out of it, and I remember telling Bobby, I do this shit. I felt so relieved. I said, if I keep doing this shit, I'm gonna lose all my money. Because <laughs> 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 before I sold Def Jam too, so I was, you know, my, most of my money was in the dying fat ball, it hadn't, which didn't take off yet. <laughs> but I did have a bulletproof Rolls Royce back there. <laughs> well, why, why would you have a bulletproof? I don't know, my man sold it to me, he needed it. I didn't <laughs> So, you know, I, 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 I lose all my money. And, um, because I was so relieved. And I thought that the anxiety that drove me, that kept me up at night, that kept me rethinking ideas, was what made me successful, but was the moments of stillness that, had, that gave me the idea. And I made a good record. I'm making a record like rock box, or, and I'm listening to that melody. That's all I'm thinking. And the only other thing I might be thinking, besides how great that melody is, I'm very focused on it. Is wait till these motherfuckers hear this record. <laughs> All you think is wait till they. You're never thinking I'm gonna get a check. You can't be thinking I'm gonna get paid a lot for this one. It's too far of a distraction from what you're doing. It's the scriptures that you have control over the, the action alone and never the fruit. And it and it goes on and, you know, to talk about how to be engaged. You know that your work is your prayer. Your work is your prayer because then that. It was washing dishes. People do meditation, picking up the leaves in the morning in different places. That's their job. They want to make sure it's clean. They do a good job. You may be lucky enough to be drawn in by music, because music is an easy thing to promote enlightenment. But to be able to take it from music to listening to subject matter you don't want to necessarily hear about, that the captains are talking now, you know, from the music, to be able to bring that kind of stillness into your life and to try not to differentiate. It's why the physical practice of yoga is that you smile and breathe in every pose. Even the most difficult pose, and especially the most difficult poses. And then one day those poses become second nature. So you take the, that 
smile and breathe at every pose off your mat and into life. And then that promotes, you know, it, it's, it's healthy. And is there, uh, uh, I hate to say, an age requirement of this training? Is this something that you as a father uh, age is in your parents? Yeah, and your I kinda, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I like it better than selling drugs and, and eating pig feet. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I, you, know, you learn, you learn, you get older, right? Absolutely. Uh, so, some people are born, they say, I don't want to do that shit. Some people are born, they put their hand directly in the fire. Other people look at the fire in very previous life for some reason. It's like, I don't want to put my hand. And you, you're born in different stages of enlightenment. You know, um, the idea that, it, you know, uh, the one thing that in most yogis and most uh, people, in, in, in the idea of being born into a, a life, you know, with karma, with karma attached. You know, and you start a certain place. And the way you speed up your evolution or not, is part of the free will rap. But, you know, the, the, the suffering, they always see very suffering is optional rap. Right? Pain is for sure, but suffering is optional. That's kind of um, the, the way the, the yogi is thinking. They're going to eliminate suffering. It's kind of, the Buddha took all those ideas too. You know, he had more time to perfect his teachings than, than some other than Jesus didn't have much time. But that idea of suffering and pain, I mean, it's in his, his rap too. It's in the Bible. Do you aspire to be a yogi? I practice every day. I, you know, it's like to be a yogi. To, I, the idea of being enlightened, you know, to, to be enlightened, you know, to, and everything. So I find myself more and more and more finding less things annoying me. I mean, I have a little bit, you know, I don't get angry about as many things, or I don't have as much judgment. People ask me what's my favorite record, and I sometimes can actually say it's the one that's on the record on the radio right now. So more present than before, you know. I love it. That, you know, this idea that it's already inside you, that's all this bliss, that you should live that way all the time, that you're moving towards it like you're not. You're moving towards enlightenment like you're not. That, that idea that when you get out of order, you get your ass whipped, you get back in order. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many nights did I have to be a late night drunk to wake up and decide like the morning meditation better than a late night drinking? It takes time if the idea can you get past, can you speed up your evolution? Or can you accept the teaching, teachable moments and learning moments and use them? And that's really what my book's about. The book's about practices so you can accept this perfection and operate from it as opposed to keep banging your head. You say people always ask you what's your favorite record. I like to ask what's your favorite mantra. Oh, I, oh, the mantra, this is the funny bit of that. I gave a mass mantra in my book for meditation as well. And the TM people, they, they charge you $1,500 a month for it. I mean, you pay for it, you don't tell them why. So I paid $2,500, that's how much it used to cost. It's kind of the elitist thing, maybe $20 and you can get a mantra, a vibration that you can repeat. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of pissed off. You get a mass mantra, that's a good vibration for most uh, nervous systems. Rum is pretty good for an adult. That's twenty five hundred dollars each one. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is, that I, wish, I almost wish they had given it to me. If you sit, if the, the meditation, if you sat and you and you repeated wrong, then it doesn't have to be like some they say sit and don't move. But, but the TM people, they they say wrong. They might want to scratch, and then a few minutes you're like, I don't know. <laughs> and the thought settles. And it, most people won't meditate because after a couple of minutes they'll be like, my mind's going crazy. I'm not doing this. The mind is like a monkey in a cage, it's going to go crazy. When the minute you sit down and start repeating your mantra, the mind is going to fuck you, it's going to go crazy. And then if you're patient, you're patient, in a couple of minutes you'll find, oh shit, I'm meditating, your mind will go crazy again. <laughs> and it'll transcend the thoughts more. And it'll transcend the thoughts more. And the one thing you can agree on in meditation is it requires patience. And for sure, even with that mantra and just with the, the willingness to sit, well, none of you will sit five minutes before you'll give up, but if you sit for 20 minutes, somewhere between two and 10 minutes, you're going to find a real stillness start to settle in, and you'll start to transcend all the noise. And if you do it every day, you know, if you do it one day. For 20 minutes, you open your eyes, you might wake up, open your eyes, and everything will be like colorful and be bright and pretty. Uh, or you just might wake up and be relieved. If you woke up with a headache and your nose was clogged and you sat there and you didn't need that long, Finally, not breathing for a minute. You open up and say, "What happened? That clogged nose and that headache—it's gone." 
It won't take 20 minutes. The headache and the nose block will go on for 20 minutes. It's an easy thing to do. And um, you know, they'll give you little tricks. Close your eyes, open your arms, close your eyes. Now I'm sick, you know. Or they'll tell you, like the story I told you about the monkey, lots of ways to not think about thinking. Or think about not thinking. <laughs> but it's not about, and if you have a thought, you can drift off into the thought and gently come back to your mantra. So if you're reading a book and you love that book, it's because it's natural. The mantra will become more satisfying with the thoughts. But even if it doesn't, you don't have to concentrate heavy on it. Just concentrate on it lightly. And if you lose it to a thought, finish the thought. Or if you want to scratch, scratch. But you know, the thought won't be more, it won't be more valuable. The mind will be more attracted to the mantra. The body won't want to scratch. You can't, the nervous system calms down. And it's something that you carry all day. You do it enough days in a row. You'll find yourself in a meditative state in the middle of a busy day. And that is one of the most uh, gratifying things to, to, to move into what they call samadhi, to live in, in the kind of meditative state. So, that's meditation. 2,500 times. <laughs> that's just a lot of money to charge. They've lowered the price, but the re what they do with the money, just so you know, and why I'm on the board is that we've given it to tens of thousands of students. And in a school in Detroit that was on 60 Minutes and now it transformed itself. I went to a school in Washington in the hood with a guy named Dr. Rutherford, who is um, giving TM to the students. And it's an amazing school and do amazing work. And just because of it in 10 minutes, and I'm telling you 20 minutes, for the kids 10 minutes, they, they don't need to live it, they don't need shit. And they do it twice a day, they don't have violence. They have the greater capacity to learn because their mind is settled. And it really, for kids, it really is a very, my kids meditate. We make them meditate. And it, it makes a difference. And is the government aware that? Oh, yeah, they, yeah, we do it through school. We do it, yeah. You know, I mean, Michelle Obama, you know, and, and knows and meditates, and I guess there's one looking weird in public, you know, because the people still have a stigma that it's some kind of religious thing. I have a school in Africa, which I'm a big supporter, the Maharishi Institute, named after the guy who, who uh, brought meditation into America more than anybody else. The Maharishi and the Beatles, everybody following around. So the Maharishi Institute, where all the students meditate, you can see the school where a lot of them do. And it's, it's a, it's a, there was a moment where a lot of the parents from different tribes were very uh, worried. Like, what are, we, what are we meditating on? You can say nothingness, but that, that don't work. And it's a vibration. What does it mean? It means that the vibrations that they give out in TM are simply vibrations. They're meant not to have a meaning because it's just simple. If you talk about nothing, this is going to be the meaning, right? So, so some people would say let go in different kinds of meditation, but just that mantra is really good. TM is something that, do you have any initiatives on trying to get TM more accepted in the United yes. States like, school system? Yeah, yeah, and because the results are so obvious. Um, there's, a, there's a group, Bent on Learning, which I'm on, uh, I support, and they put yoga and meditation in schools. And then we just, we have schools, we're always raising money to, to uh, put meditation in schools. Lots of public schools and lots of private schools have meditation. A lot of charter schools especially. We talk with, uh, what city schools? What is the name of um, Bill Milligan's group? The biggest charter school group in the country. They're putting it in schools as quickly as they can. But it takes, you know, a counselor to go in and give you a kid a mantra. Do you think you, you have more of Communities, communities and schools. And where do you think you find more resistance from this initiative? Do you find more resistance from the inner city? Uh, the private, well, not really. The private system? Um, I, I don't think we find more in the inner city, but the parents are not very well. The religious communities uh, or religious leaders sometimes can find, you know, we don't call it meditation, we call it quiet time. Right. Quiet time. But, you know, the idea of sitting in stillness shouldn't be a threat to any religious idea. Um, some of this is really, not intentionally, but some of the preachers or imams or rabbis or whatever, they don't let you think for yourself so much. Sit still too long, you might not like it. You know, you might think, I was in the church talking about the holy bird, you guys shut me up. So I tell them, look what they do to the chicken. That's the holy bird, man. Everybody's <laughs> 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 
Mm -hmm. Some chicken right after you speak. <laughs> Normally, in, in schools in America, when we use quiet time, it's usually as a, as a punishment for children. So I mean, it has been used as punishment. It has been. So I think the dynamic is different as opposed to saying, "Well, let's just back up and take a time out," as in, as opposed to you've been bad. No, no, that's not, I understand, I've not heard that a lot of times, equally as much better. Whenever they say quiet time in school, it doesn't have that connotation, no one really, uh, no, I, I, I never heard a student say, no, my mother did that to me, I don't want that. No, I, I, I never heard that, but I know that's possible. And if there's one, um, I guess, solid message that you were trying to send from the book, what would that be? Empowerment. Because I feel like a lot of people are, just do what the crowd does. And one of the things about meditation, you could actually sit, I mean, even if you're sitting and you're reading a mantra, noise comes and noise goes. Thoughts that come in your head, you kind of take inventory. Because the idea is to be a watcher. So the thoughts, you can watch them without your nervous system going crazy. You get a better view of them when your nervous system is not connected to every thought. And you're kind of just watching your thoughts, which is what you want to do in life. But that initial, the idea of watching your thoughts, you can say, I don't want to do that. They're doing what? They're going where? Well, I'm doing that. And they're going to go do, you know, and kids need to be able to make choices on their own. They need to be empowered. So that's one part of it, but all of it is about empowerment. The book is, uh, people tell me it changed my life. It made me get up and do something, you know. It made me feel um, those moments, you know, it's, it's like what's in the scripture should always empower you. If you take it from there, if you write some things in such a way that it rings a bell, <coughs> it rings a bell, like a key turning in the head, and then people sometimes act on it. So the idea was to empower people, and it really it had, you know, lots of people have told me that it changed their lives or empowered them in various different ways, and, that, and that's the purpose. Wonderful. I wonder if you can take some questions. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people. You have the microphones raised. Yeah, this is, well, these aren't all my students. So. Um, from the student, could the students from my class raise your hands, please? This is this is probably half of them. I think the rest of them have other classes. Right. Extremely, extremely dirt poor, and you didn't make as much money as you did. Would you feel you would be just as successful in life um, with your meditation, with just your meditation, and uh, having no money at all? I mean, it does money play a part in your success, basically? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I haven't you know, the practice of destroying the ego and the practice of, of uh, you know, accepting where you are. And, you know, acceptance is, you know, everything's in perfect order. It's easy to say, people say, oh, all is perfect order, and you're sitting in your back room with Maybach. You should go ahead and try it now. For some reason, I have that car, and I'm comfortable. It's kind of, it's a little notch. I don't have a lot of this shit, but I have a car, the Maybach. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I really tell you that the, the, the evolution, the personal evolution that I've had, is the same. The experiences I have that gave me them is probably different, are different. So, in other words, as a per you know, I don't, um, would I have, you know, if not coming into contact with certain philosophies and certain people and certain inspirations, I may not have been able to, you know, been inspired to do. Like when I got to I was, have some experience. I got to play, I remember Christmas rap in Curtis Blow, 1979. I have a plane, I'm in Amsterdam, I've never been on a plane in my life. What would you like, Mr. Simmons? Like, first, I didn't know who the fuck you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, I remember, it was, a, it was a moment, you know, it's kind of a, you should kind of find these moments in all moments. You should find re information in all, you know, you learn through, you know, through practice, you learn to try to appreciate more things, right, than just the melody of just that Mr. Simmons rap. You know, I gave my I like some cocaine and some pussy. <laughs> we went down to that. And he said right away. He said, right away. <laughs> that was a good experience. It was like 
tiro gratis, gracias. But the experience, you know, of somebody like, you know, being, there, there is a moment where you'll get, if somebody likes it, it means something. You know, I can't lie that you, you're, that, that you're giving something and someone gives you something back as a show of appreciation. You know, knowing all the time in my heart, although I, you know, I accept some of these things, you know, I, I, I came from the university, they gave me another thing, I got so much shit, like, on my calendars. I don't have any gold records, I have a lot of other stuff. But I got toys, right? Those statues. Awards. Awards. <laughs> I got awards everywhere, I got awards. So I got an award last night from obesity issue from Dr. Oz. I got an award today. You know, I, I started looking at them and like, piling them up. They, you know, it, 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 they don't really mean a lot, but they're just part of, you know, like, Toys are okay. You don't get too attached to them. Um, I don't. I don't think that um, they have anything to do with your happiness. We already know. I too much research on that. That toys have nothing to do with your happiness. Um, I always say to people, they say they're suffering. You know, you got cable, don't you? I talked to Juice Jones, who lives here. He's no fuck that. We got books. Got all these beautiful children he's raised. He's great kids, and he's raised in difficult cir circumstances. But he so said, we got books. That's all we. I always joke that if you have cable, what would you want? You know, I'm never home to see what I want to see anyway. But. So it's really, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's self inflicted the pain from not having it. And it's self inflicted the ego from having it. You know, it's, it's up to, your happiness is only in here. So I know that. Do I know that I would have come in contact with? And, and you know, you have these feelings anyway. You wake up in the morning excited about what you're going to give. Uh, and not what you're going to get. So if you have that, that kind of experience, you wake up what you're going to get, it's the same. It's ongoing too. There's always like something new, new shit. Until you're enlightened, it's always new shit, new shit, new shit. Maybe a less, maybe a new shit could be that you're giving something that matters to other people. It could be a little bit more selfless. Uh, but to answer the question, I, I think I prefer to have a shit than not. My question is, uh, there's a man who knows enlightenment. <laughs> uh, you, you ever get in the zone? Yeah. The rim, rim is so big you can throw the ball in the back of your head, it'll make no difference. <laughs> right? Like throwing a ball in the ocean or something, right? Yeah. You get hot, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, All right, my question is, um, you know, <laughs> imagine living like that all the time. I'm sorry, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, uh, you know, we have like all these, we have like all these practices, and, you know, lifting sessions, like all this stuff. But you know, we don't really, we don't really. I haven't like really heard of like having like actual yoga sessions or like time like to really mediate. My question is to you. I know how like mediating. <laughs> 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 Meditation will, yeah, what's the name, Pat Riley makes it more meditative. Yeah. He did, right? Yeah. I think it'll definitely affect your performance. You want to you want to be in a zone, right? You want to be hot, you know, that comes at a kind of ease. When the noise is gone, and we talked about when the mind is still, that's when you're in the state of yoga. And you have these moments, extended moments, when you're playing ball and you get real hot. The brain just opens up and the noise is gone. You're not thinking about anything. In fact, you're thinking about nothing, but you're there. They awake. Just you want to live awake. That's people, the physical practice, that's why you have the pranayama and breathing exercise. They go practice and smile in every difficult pose. And you're trying to get to where you are in those moments. And the yoga practice is meant to bring you there. You know, um, and so yeah, meditation and yoga is very, very good for an athlete who has to be like, you know, precise. And you want the noise going, you want to be focused. Single point focus is also what they mean by meditation. If only your mantra is there and all the rest of the noise is gone, this is what you're looking for. So yes, if there was a, a, a yoga practice for your team, if it was meditation for your team, it would make a difference. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to tell my coach that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Russell Simmons, first off, I want to say, oh my God, it's Russell Simmons. <laughs> 
I'm going to Rice University, I go to HCD, I'm still in high school. Um, what I wanted to ask is, if you could think back to when you were in high school, uh, if someone like yourself were to ever recommend you, you know, to go and be in the yogi, you know, taking a meditation, would you have ever considered it? How would you react to that? I don't think, back then, I was, you know, I, I guess people are born in different stages of, of evolution, mm -hmm. and, and, and they also find different routes and paths to, to the same, to all the way in the same place, the same idea of enlightenment is going to happen, you know, it takes lifetimes or you can speed it up or you can speed it up. I was not in a good space as a young person. It happened, you know, um, I was surrounded by people who were not in a good space, you know. I was not lucky in that way. Um, but I was lucky to find, you know, a little bit more peace, a little bit more. So I don't think I would have been ready or open up to God. I didn't want to go to church. I wanted nothing. That was, you know, so it was, I wasn't that bad, but I wasn't that good. And I didn't think I was good compared to my friends. Because whatever that meant, I, you know what that is, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm not that bad, is it? Yeah, he's telling people. I'm probably doing these shots. Exactly. I'm probably doing these shots. I'm probably doing these shots. I'm probably doing these shots. I'm probably doing she says that you do make your children meditate, but how are other individuals of your family, like your brother, for example, as a prosperity preacher, how does he respond to the yogi practice? Has he embraced it? He's not a good class with me. We talk scripture all the time. He tells me what the Bible says, and I tell him what it says right there in yoga scriptures about it. How can yoga be difficult or something? And we talk scripture a lot. We talk, find out we never say anything that contradicts each other ever about any subject. You know, he did as a prosperity preacher, you know, he made me a little nervous with that first chapter. The first chapter is redefining rich. And he gave me the rap. Years before it reminded me that Jesus taught two sermons. But plus you can't give them all this because it's not the people are, they want they got problems. So they need to know in the first chapter they're gonna be able to resolve their problems. And he gave me again about Jesus teaching those two sermons, you know, and and so I put it in the first chapter, and finally the first chapter felt like people would read the book and not throw it away. I didn't want that. So then the, the book ran smoothly, but I had to, because it's not the secret. My book is not the secret. But it is the core of the secret. And, you know, that's an important point. It's the core of the secret. Is the secret the secret? No. <laughs> no, I mean, you're still going to pray for things, and then don't worry, we'll get it all, and, you know, we deserve it all, and pray for it. It's just the most more neediness. And, and the thing is, to relieve neediness, that's the thing. It's the thing that's promised by everybody. This will get you happiness. This will give you Christ consciousness or nirvana or whatever you want. Just, just get rid of the neediness. Neediness causes suffering. Needing nothing is the, is, the, is the state we're looking for. So the secret, the core of it is God. And then, of course, like in Lakshmi, there's this Indian deity, this goddess of Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity. You see that she's like this, right? She's just giving. And she don't have to look down because she's just piled up that she's giving. Piled up. It's the cycle of giving that she's born into. And that we want to be blessed with prosperity is to keep giving. To be able to keep giving. It. And you keep getting it because you keep giving. Next question. Hello. In your book, you talk about the insecurity of, of money and how if you chase money, money will run from you. Yeah. As a, a business owner, that's a hard teaching because you don't look at yourself as being successful if you're not making money. So how do you get past that of not chasing it? Well, you know, it's the first year to be looking. If the idea of going inside for happiness is, is critical. That's what it's all about. There's nothing, there's nothing else but that. But be able to do that is critical. So that's the first step for a lot of people. All people who chase money, get money. You know, there's a the subject of karma yogi and then the business yogi in there, in my book. And the idea of giving what you love. Um, and you can, everything you sell, people like. They bought it, they must like it. The drug dealer, he's happy, the drug addict is happy. True, right? The drug, addict, the drug dealer's happy, the drug addict's happy. The drug dealer generally dies before the drug addict. The karma 
give what you what you love. There's a story in the book about a steakhouse owner who is the, the, the pillar of the community. He feeds the hungry, he takes care of everybody, and all the banquets said everybody loves him, the nicest guy in the world. He dies, leaves his son the vegan in the steakhouse. <laughs> son just keeps profiting from him. He knows all the things I said about the oil and the abuse of animals and the pain and the suffering and the sickness and the cancer and the, and the <coughs> environment. He knows all that stuff. He doesn't need it. He doesn't participate. He just also knows it makes him sick, gives him cancer. He's not going to do that. But he sells it. Different, right? So you can give what you love. And, it, and everybody, everybody else can be different. It can be a little different. You know, you don't, you know, absolute. But, you know, be comfortable with what you do, what you give. So, and that, that has something to do with the money thing. Uh, you make it when you're happy. And uh, there's no stability because we don't get out of here, go check, get a hat, my father would say. You got, you're gonna die. So I say it. And you got a short time, you have to be happy. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Kunal. I, I'm a student here at Rice. And I was just wondering, uh, do you think you yourself are completely enlightened, and how far are you till you know, you reach? Well, I'm a long way. <laughs> yeah, see, um, I, don't know, I, 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 I know for sure. I mean, I don't know. I know mean, how far am I? He said, Lord Buddha's last problem is um, the flesh. It was the last problem. I the whole. I'm like the country. Um, no, I, I can't even find a girl. I can't even keep a girl. <laughs> you know, I'm single. You know, I don't have this, you know, I don't so enlightened. What do you does that mean free from any kind of neediness or, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not at all. I just have faith in the path. And I you know, and um I have faith in the path and I and I and I find myself really trying to adhere to it more often, not because of restrictions, not trying to be too holy. Um, but you do do things that you lose a little bit of restriction. You do get up in the morning and go over and light that candle even when you don't feel like it. You do go to yoga class even if you haven't slept. You do do things that, and, and you find, you know, that, that require a little bit of resilience and, and, and faith that you want, that it's part of a practice to make you better and more whole. You do show up, you do give, you do, I run five, six charities, chairman of five. I'm involved in a bit more. I do the work. And I have, and, and, and maybe for selfish reasons in some cases, so I'll feel better. They say you work on the seven chakras, you know, to self, to self, you know, be different. And as you get here, you become, you know, you're a servant for everyone. You'd be a complete servant, but you have your first chakra, you gotta take care of that before you serve the rest, right? So, some of the stuff I do is kind of selfish. Some of the work I do is, is uh, I, don't do, I don't do a lot of shit without credit. I want to do more shit without credit. I do, so I'd be surprised how much. But I do, some of it is accolades, money. I like giving and getting, I like giving and getting. I like trading. I love, I love like to, to have a really good business that really empowers people and keep trying to make that business better. I choose less hurtful things. I wouldn't put no fur on my collar. I'm not snorkel, I just simply get out of my deal. I mean, I do those things that I do. So, no, I'm not a nightmare. Do we have time for one more question, I think? Hello, my name is Louisa Butler. I'm a first year student here at the MBA program at Rice. I want to thank you for your time. And actually, I had a follow up question to what you were just talking about. Which but I don't even think people sell drugs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Uh, it's about the giving because you've done a lot. You've mentioned a lot of the charity work that you've done. So, is there a cause that you haven't approached yet that you want to do uh, some work on? Well, we do the thing at the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding with the moms and the rabbis and help the dialogue around the country and around the world now a lot more. We do the thing at the school in Africa and we work with the Diamond Power Fund, we do the Rush Foundation, arts and school critical. Um, we do a lot of social and political work. You know, I work for the president, travel around to the salient work, and, and also, you know, lots of other work with the White House, a lot of social stuff. Um, you know, fighting Islamophobia in America, the care of passion is still so important, it's so big. The threat to the First Amendment, they couldn't build a mosque next door to me or whatever around the corner. I look directly across the wall trade. Things as they come up, 
the violence in our communities. I'm here with Captain Dennis Muhammad, who's building something called the Peacekeepers. Captain Dennis. He, he said that's 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 right. So Captain Dennis and I, you know, and he's building a peacekeeper movement. I really want to do a lot more for men control the communities. Uh, and work with him. You know, easy because uh, uh, he's got a nucleus of Nation Islam, uh, brothers who are willing to walk the street, you know, and, and with them we build from that nucleus and have peacekeepers all over the country. We have this idea that would be a uh, Men are just not violent, just not even not violent. You know, they're not violent anyway. But the idea that they, you know, have the courage to say, "Why are you doing that?" You know, for this hour, that was just, we call it the hour of power. They patrol the streets. They can tell you where all the rehabs, where all the uh, other violent prevention programs. They tell you all the programs that are in the community, and their whole community meeting. They put the thread together, all of the community organizations that are meant to help the community. Uh, the violence in our community is crazy about know that. And kids kill each other like. And they, they don't talk about it. And they, when, when, uh, that same uh, day that the congresswoman got shot that week, I don't know how many kids got killed, but it was a week before that, 40 kids got shot in, in Chicago in one week. Like that wasn't the discussion about gun control because the congresswoman got shot. Those 40 kids, you know, they're not even servants. They're not even getting paid to serve. Um, they're, not even, they're not even news workers. So that's a, a, a thing that I really want to dedicate more time. I've done some, but, and I've been involved in many of the programs, but I want to be, I want to build a program that's sustainable and big. But I hold it, somebody gets some money to it, we can really get people involved. Any point of words, Uncle Ruff? I'm happy to be here. I mean, it's my third school today. And, 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 you went to the Dorothy the Bryan Institute the other day. Yeah, and, and um, what was the answer? And the um, and, and um, this was the most attentive audience in the way that's kind of thoughtful. And the idea that you, I, I'm happy to see you teach it. I mean, are you teaching me? I don't know the whole thing about that. I'm going to teach it in school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is only possible because of the joy that you hope to give your life. So we really appreciate you coming and giving me that time. Everyone, please stay up.